everyone. Welcome back to worship as we come to worship our God. Let's sing praise to our God. Hymn 45, hymn 45. Now unto Jehovah, ye sons of the mighty. Welcome to our service of worship here at Covenanters as we gather to worship our God. Just thinking as we're singing that hymn, we're speaking of the mighty voice of the Lord. And I was just thinking of Sinai, where the people heard the voice of the Lord and trembled before God. They were overwhelmed by his holiness and, uh, and wanted him to stop speaking. And, uh, but we come, uh, we still must tremble at God's holiness, but we come through Christ. And he has given us peace. He, has, he calls us into his presence and he speaks with us as his children. And we have the privilege this morning and again this afternoon to hear him speak uh, to us, his people. And what a profound privilege and blessing that is. Special welcome this morning if you're visiting with us. And uh, it's good. We have some space and able to invite people and visitors. And that's a wonderful thing. And, and uh, praise God for that. Uh, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning. And so if you're visiting um, you can look in the bulletin where there are um, just some questions as far uh, for you to consider uh, if for your own participation in the Lord's Supper. And um, so review, look, look those over. And if you can affirm uh, the, the points in the bulletin, then you are welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. Well, let's prepare our hearts uh, with, uh, with some silent prayer as we await the call of our God. To, to worship him.
brothers and sisters in Christ, please stand. Hear your God call you to worship this morning. Psalm 65. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion, and to you the vows shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Let's come before our God. Let's seek his face as we approach him in worship. O Lord our God, almighty God, we are blessed. We are truly blessed as we approach to you, to your throne, in your house, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. O Lord, how can unholy man approach a holy God without being consumed? We can only do so through the atonement that you've given, that we could be again at one with you when once we were separated by our sin. Christ has come and drawn us to you and you to us. He has reconciled us together. Lord, we come then to, into your house. We come to dwell in your courts. We come to where you are, and we come, yes, Lord, recognizing your holiness, but also delighting ourselves in your uh, forgiveness and your love and your mercy that you've shown to us. We get to meet with you, O oh Lord. Teach us, even this morning, teach us what that means. Lord, after several weeks, we are again able to gather in larger numbers. We praise and thank you for this. We thank you that you have heard our many prayers as we've cried out to you for larger gatherings. And Lord, we thank you that you have worked in the hearts of our leaders to grant our request. And Lord, we thank you that you have um, in this time still been, you've still been blessing us. You've been encouraging our hearts. You've been building us up. You've enabled us to be witnesses uh, to you, even in the worship of these last few weeks, Lord. And we uh, thank you for it. Lord, we, we praise and thank you that we, this morning we get to participate in the Lord's Supper. What a blessing that is, uh, that we, Lord, can, can have uh, communion with you in the Lord's Supper as well as in the word that we'll hear today. Lord, we pray that you'd bless our time with you this morning and bless all those who are joining us online, that they too would know your blessing, would know your presence, would know your power this morning as the word goes forth. Lord, we pray that you would satisfy us in your house this morning, and that you would shine your face upon us in this hour and bless us. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God, hymn 614. Hymn 614. Now Israel may say, and that in truth.
seated. Turn to the Word of God for the revelation of God's will to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, we'll read verses 19 to 21, part of Jesus' instructions from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's... Come before our God, confessing our sin and seeking forgiveness in Christ together as his church. Lord on high, we humbly approach before your throne of grace. We come before you, Lord, the creator of all things, acknowledging that we owe you everything that we are. And knowing, Lord, that in the created things that we will not find treasures that we need or lasting treasure, we will only find that outside of this world and you. Lord, this world and all that is in it is passing away. All around us is only temporary. We see this already. We know this in our lived experience. Things rust and break, deteriorate and fall apart. Our stuff is stolen or repossessed. Or we have lots of stuff and we just lose interest in it or no longer want it. Even, Lord, in our relationships, Lord, loved ones pass away, move away. Relationships can be broken. Lord, whatever the treasure of this world is, it's limited and it's quickly squandered. Happiness is elusive. Satisfaction is sought but never found. And things or people or whatever, Lord, we might be seeking in this world. Lord, why then do we store up treasure here in this world? Why do we look for security in the things of earth? Oh, Lord, as your people, we confess that we too can be drawn to this world. Our eyes too low, not lifted up to you, but fixed on this life in this world. We drink in worldly promises, hopes, and dreams without discernment and without checking our hearts. We're not honest with ourselves about where our future hope lies and what is giving us joy and satisfaction, or so we think. In so many ways, Lord, we practically live a life of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Forgive us, O God, when we've chosen this world over the world to come. Forgive us when we've preferred earth to heaven. Especially, Lord, forgive us when we've preferred the sinful things of this world compared to the holy things of God. Lord, we thank you for the good gifts of this life. We thank you you've given us many good things to enjoy. But help us to enjoy them, Lord, without setting our heart on them. Help us to be thankful for them without seeking full and complete satisfaction in them. Set our heart on things above, O Lord. And above all, fix our heart on you, the one who dwells above in the heavens. And fix us on Christ. Fix us on this Savior you sent. And so, Lord, let the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Purify our desires and our pursuits. Remind us of our eternal inheritance, which is stored up in heaven for us, which will never be defiled, which will never be corrupted, which will never be stolen, which will never break or fall apart or disappear, for it is secured in Christ. Lord, remind us of the place you are preparing for us in glory, the place you are preparing so that where you are, we may be also. And comfort us in these things, that when this world, when there are frustrations, when there, Lord, when, when, we, uh, when we feel the emptiness of this world, when we recognize that choices we make to pursue heaven rather than earth will leave us, in some sense, uh, poorer in this world, 
We pray that we would make the right decisions, reminded that our hope is in heaven, and there, Lord, we will have treasure that far surpasses anything we've ever gained in this life. Make us willing to give up all of this life and everything in it for the sake of your heavenly kingdom, should you require that of us. And we thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, he who left heaven to come to earth to save us, he who never had a wrong desire or a misplaced love, he who, Lord, always had his heart fixed on you, his heavenly Father. Fix our hearts on you and on, on your truth, just like Jesus. And by his grace, may we live like him evermore. Hear our prayers then, Lord. We know we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the encouragement from 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And so let us live, anticipating that inheritance promised to us. Let's sing praise to our God as we prepare as well for the reading and preaching of God's word, hymn six thirty four, sweet hour of prayer. Luke 18. Luke 18, we'll read the first eight verses, the parable of the unjust judge, and then we'll turn to Psalm 123, and we'll consider uh, the word of the Lord from the book of Psalms this morning. So we'll begin in the New Testament in Luke 18, and then turn to Psalm 123.
Then he spoke a parable to them. That is, Jesus spoke a parable to them. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Let's turn now to Psalm 123. Psalm 123, a song of ascents. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease with the contempt of the proud. Let's seek God's blessing in prayer before we hear the word preached. Lord our God, we thank you for the means of grace that you've given us. And especially, Lord, their uh, effectiveness in public corporate worship corporate prayer of your people, corporate praise of your people, now that we've had the word read, and we anticipate the word preached, and prepare us as well for the word demonstrated, seen, shown, and and pressed upon us in the Lord's Supper. Lord, as we turn to the word preached, we pray that you would teach us much about our prayer life, about our access to you, about the wonderful hope that we have in our God the hope that we have for real comfort from your throne of grace. Help me, Lord, to proclaim your word faithfully. Equip me by your spirit, O Lord, and do mighty work in such a way that you would receive all the glory and, that, uh, and, and Lord, that, that no man could take any credit. Work powerfully, we pray, for the sake of your own name and out of love for us, your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, children tend to have a persistence in trying to get what they want. And boys and girls, I'm sure, I'm not talking about you. But children tend to have a persistence. When they want something, they want it, and they'll ask for it, and they will, they will call out. And, 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 and sometimes when, when things aren't needed, and you know those times you hear just the constant maybe from their bedroom when they're supposed to be going to sleep, and yet they keep calling and calling and calling and calling and calling. It seems like they're just not going to give up. You're thinking you're going to outweigh them, and somehow, sometimes it works. But a lot of times you're sitting there, okay, this, you know, you need to be quiet. You need to stop trying to call. They test patience. Of course, though, there are times when it's needed in an emergency, when someone gets hurt, when a child gets hurt, they look for the first person they can trust and go calling for help. They go running, or, or another child goes running and says, quick, come, 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 come. There's someone injured. He tripped, and he hurt himself, and we need your help. And, and it's good. They come. They're looking. There's a persistence. They don't just let it go. They, they keep coming until someone comes and provides the help, the, 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 the support that's needed. Well, like a, like a persistent child, you and I need God. Like a child in, in great need, you and I need God. Now, there are things that we think we need God for that we don't, or we can be asking God, and boys and girls, we, we can talk about this. I was 
telling Titus this the other night, things are talking about what we pray for and, you know, praying and being persistent in your prayer for a new bicycle is maybe not what God is getting at, but, but there are great deep needs that we have and, and, and our needs for body and soul every single day. We have a need for God that, that lends to us being persistent before God. Now, we needed God before the fall. We needed God before sin ever entered the world. God created us and because we're created and he's the creator. We had a dependence on him. He's, God is the only one who is absolutely self-sufficient. He's the only one who has no need of anyone else or anything else. God is God. But before the fall, we needed God to provide. He, he created things. We needed God to sustain the creation and to provide for the continuation of seasons and for the food and, and our everyday needs. But that need has only multiplied, infinitely multiplied after the fall, when sin has entered into the world, when, when there has been, when there is a, a, a gap between us and God and our relationship with God that cannot be bridged by anything we do. We cannot build anything, do anything ourselves to reach to God. It's a need we cannot satisfy. And even as the children of God, we are still needing the help of God to, to battle sin, to put away remaining corruption in us. And we need the help of God. We have a great need of God to deal with the consequences of sin. Broken relationships and, and, and sickness and disease and every day the list goes on and on. The blood, sweat, and tears that goes into putting food on your table. We have a great need for God. <clears throat> and as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a great need for our God, don't we? We are living with a view of the world that is in direct opposition to the view of the world around us. God has taught us the truth of his word, a truth that is rejected by our culture and those who want to hold to the truth of God are out of sync with the, with the, the teachings of the culture. And we need strength to stand firm on the word of God, to stand firm and to declare what God says. That our life is not about ourselves and what feels good to me. It's about living for God. The truth that there is, in fact, sin, and there is a judge who will judge us for our sin, and we need forgiveness. The truth that there is a hell, a just separation from God for all who refuse God and refuse the mercy that he extends in Jesus Christ. We truly are countercultural by the very nature of the fact that, in our, uh, that, that fallen man is in rebellion against God. And any who have been restored to God will, will, be, will, will, will not be able to stand on their own in such a culture that still wants to rebel. You and I need God more than we think. But let, you need to consider this as well. That, that God is willing to receive you more than you think. God is willing to hear your cries. He's willing to provide for your needs more than you think. This psalm is important for us to consider. It's important for us as the church to hear. Because not only does it tell us where our need will be satisfied, but it tells us that we have a God who is willing to be heard, who's willing to be needed, who is willing to provide. On the one hand, we can say, well, sure, we need to go to God. To whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, as the disciples said to Christ. On the other hand, brothers and sisters, we come to a God who is willing to receive us, willing to help us, whose heart for his people is, 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 is full of love and grace and compassion. The question for us this morning is, are we willing to seek that help? Are we willing to be that persistent child at the throne of our Father, or coming to our, our, our God in heaven, persistently seeking his help, saying, Lord, I need you, and I will not let you go until you bless me? Are we willing to go until God responds? That is the message of this psalm. We need to look up to our God in heaven for his help in this, on this earth. Look up with expectation to God who dwells in heaven because he alone is the help you need for the trouble on earth. Look up with expectation to the God who dwells in heaven because he alone is the help you need for the trouble on earth. Very simply this morning, we're going to consider the psalm in two, two points. First, verses 1 and 2, look up to heaven. Verses 3 and 4, look up from earth. Look up to heaven and look up from earth. 
First, in verses 1 and 2, we're going to consider this, this uh, exhortation from the psalmist to look up to heaven. Now, this psalm is set in a worship context. We need to understand that. It is a psalm of ascent. The 15 psalms of ascent are, are compiled, have been put together by the, by the inspired editor of the book of Psalms as a, as a collection of psalms that, uh, that were used... Uh, there's, some, there's some discussion as to how exactly they were used, but they were believed to have been used for uh, pilgrims who were on their way up to Jerusalem. They were songs of ascent, ascending up to Jerusalem, up to the mountain of God, up to the temple, as they were on their way for the three times a year that Israelites were required to go to Jerusalem, to the temple, for worship. There are others who will say, well, this, these psalms were actually those sung by the people of God when they were coming out of exile, when they were leaving Babylon, when they were, they were returning to the promised land, and that they would have been sung on the way up to Jerusalem in a profound way. And, and I think the answer to the which is which is it's both and. They were sung on their way to worship, and these were psalms that were no doubt sung in a profound way as the people of God returned after decades away from Jerusalem. The psalm is also set in in book five of the Psalms, the last book, and the, the, you've heard me tell you this before, that the book of Psalms traces the history of Israel, traces its rise, particularly its history surrounding the, the throne of David and the promises God made for one to sit on the throne that would remain on the throne forever. And it follows the rise of the Davidic king and kingdom to their fall and the exile. And now in book five, they're, they're learning, the people of God are learning to put their trust not in some man to sit on the throne, but in God himself. He is the king that they needed to put their hope in. They had put their hope in the wrong place. The Lord is king. And wonderfully and gloriously in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we're going to find the Lord is going to be the Davidic king in Jesus Christ, the God man sitting on the throne who remains on the throne today. But at this point, they're anticipating that. And so this is, a, this is a song that was sung in worship, and it was to bring the people to put their hope and their trust, not in the man on the throne, but in the Lord, who was their true king. And what we have here, then, is the cry of the church to their Lord, the cry of the church to their king, the cry of the church to their God. Now, it might seem obvious in some ways. You might say, well, isn't it obvious People are going to worship that obviously they're going to seek the Lord. They're obviously going to, to seek God. This is a song of worship. But the question is, is it that obvious? And what is, our own, what is our own motivation for coming to worship? What is our own motivation for being here this morning or planning to come this afternoon? We think, well, worship is about meeting with God. But do you and I really come to worship with an expectation that we will meet with the living God? Do we come with that kind of expectation? Is it just because it's Sunday and it's the good thing to do? It's, it's a good, morally upright, somehow beneficial thing to do? Or is it just a pattern of our lives? Or do we come with an expectation that when we come to worship God, we're crying out to him? We are able to, to seek his face. It, we're not coming just to get from God. We're coming to, give, to praise God and give him the worship due his name. But yet we're meeting with the living God. It's not a small thing. It's not a small thing. We get to, we get to come and seek him. to desire the communion that God promises his people when they come and meet with him in public corporate worship. This worshiper, this psalmist knows, seems to have this sense, we're going to worship God, we're going to seek our God, and we need him. We need him. He knows his need. He knows where that help is going to come from. So he begins the psalm. In some ways, there's a bit of a drama to begin the psalm because it, he's speaking, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. And continues on. We don't actually get to the name of the Lord until the end of verse 2. There's a bit of drama. Who is he speaking about? Who is the you that he's speaking of? Well, it is, he says, unto you I lift up my eyes. It's clearly someone who's up above and, and beyond him. There's a, there's a position of humility already at the beginning of this psalm. It's unto you I lift up my eyes. I'm not looking down on you. I've not brought you down to my eye level. I'm looking up. I'm looking up. I'm a humble worshiper. We, we find in the, the language of Psalm 123, no doubt brings you back a couple psalms to Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We hear that this psalmist is speaking of, of one who is, uh, speaking of this one in heaven. He says, similarly, oh, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Not, not speaking of his creation, but of his dwelling place. 
God dwells in heaven, and the contrast is stark with earth. There's trouble on earth. There's problems on earth. We're going to get to that in verses 3 and 4. But there's trouble, but where is help going to come from? Well, perhaps the psalmist, like you and me, so often was looking for help on earth, was looking to this person or that person or this help or that help and this promising resolution or, or that, but realizing help is not going to come from this world. This world is in turmoil. This world is in trouble. This world can't help itself. It needs God. We need God. I need God. And the more we walk in the Christian life, the more we come to realize that our first place to seek help must be God. He's not our last place. He's not our third place. He's not fifth. He has got to be first. We need his help. And he is willing, willing to receive us. He's not saying go Go, go, do, go try to help yourself first. He says, now come. Come. There's trouble here, but you know, there's peace in heaven. Whatever the turmoil is on the earth, there is no turmoil in heaven. Whatever trouble might be going on here, God is not moved from his throne. God is not moved from his throne. Now, it doesn't mean God doesn't care what's going on in this world. God most certainly does care. The whole story of salvation tells us God cares. But God is not moved. God is not reactionary. God is, God is not, you know, if, if we're in turmoil, we, don't, we, we can't assume God is. God isn't. He is on the throne. He is in that place of power. There's a contrast between our weakness on earth and his power in heaven. He is the glorious God in heaven. That's who we can turn to. I think of the wonderful opening to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. It matters that he's in heaven and not on earth. This worshiper in the Old Testament context comes. He's, he's on his way to Jerusalem with other worshipers. And he's coming with a hope to meet his God, to lay out his care before him. Now he's coming through the offerings, the sacrifices, the blood offerings that were required for him to enter into the, into the presence of God. But he is coming with expectation that God has made the way for him to meet with God and he, God will keep his word. And so you and I, as we come, we also come through the offering of Jesus Christ. We come through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to worship our God. We must come with an expectation that God will come down to meet with us. Because it is our God who has bridged the gap that we created by our sin. He's the one who has bridged that gap between us and him through sending his own son. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming down to earth from heaven in order to bring, be able to bring heaven to us and us to heaven. It is Christ who came down and shed his own blood to put away that which divided and separated us from God, to put away our sin. He had to come down to us because we couldn't reach up to heaven. And without Christ, we would have no hope of a relationship with God. And now Christ, in having completed his work, has ascended up back into heaven. And there is preparing a place for you and for me who are trusting in him that where he is, we may be also, and that we one day will go to dwell with him and be in the tri presence of the triune God forever and ever, never, ever separated again. But until that time, you and I still have wonderful access to God through Jesus Christ. We can enter into his throne room at any time, and we can come boldly to worship him together as his people every single Lord's Day with great expectation through Christ. You can look up to heaven. That's the point. You can look up to heaven, just like this worshiper. To you I lift up my eyes, or you in to dwell in the heavens. But not only can you look up to heaven, you must look up to heaven. You must look up to heaven. For heaven is the only place of help, the only place of support, the only place that will satisfy the needs that we have. And to emphasize this and to point this out, the psalmist uses the example of a servant. He said, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Until he has mercy on us. Now, when we think of this picture of a servant, and boys and girls, this might be a little bit foreign to you. Maybe as adults, we can, we can kind of picture what that might look like. But, but we don't typically have, we, I don't think any of us, have servants in our house. People that live with us, that are part of the household, part of the family. This was not just a job where you went, you, you, know, you cleaned someone's house, you got a paycheck, you went home. This was, you lived there, you were part of the family, you were completely dependent on the people you, you uh, served. 
uh, Lisa and I were in a house recently that, uh, that had a, uh, um, one of the rooms upstairs had uh, stairs that went, went out of the room, went down and into the kitchen. It was a kind of a back way to the kitchen. And it took us a, a second to figure out what that was for. The house was quite an, an older house, and, and it was there because that's where the maid, or that's where, the, that's where the, whatever their servant lives. And that's how they, she could get down to the kitchen in the morning without going through the rest of the house and could get, the, get, get things going in time for the people that, you know, the people she worked for, uh, uh, got up and, 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 and got on with the day. Well, we're not used to seeing houses with back stairs or with an upstairs, downstairs distinction. Uh, that we, you know, you see in in, uh, in older homes or from the uh, the early 20th century. But through much of history, although it's not common today in our own context, in much of history, uh, servants in the home were common, and in some places of the world, it's still common. And again, this isn't like a job that we have today. They lived in the house, and because they lived in the house, they were dependent on their master or their mistress for everything. They were dependent on them for their daily food, their provisions, their help and support in trouble. They were dependent on them for everything. And they needed their master or their mistress. And to try to bring this into a bit of our, our modern day, I mean, you can imagine if you have a business and you have a major contract, maybe it's the person you sell apples to and you sell most of your apples there or you've, you've taken on a huge renovation project and it's going to take a lot of your time, but the person you have a contract with it has a little bit over you. You're a little bit dependent on them because if they were to renege or if they weren't going to pay you, then you're going to have trouble. You're dependent on them to provide for your necessities. How are you going to put food on the table if the person buying your product decides not to actually pay you or the person who you just spent months working on their home decides not to give you the final paycheck? Now, it's, it's not exact because we have safeguards in place to make sure that you know, we get paid over time or we get paid as we go along or, or we have other means of income. We don't typically just have one job. We have maybe other sources of income or, or other contracts that we can depend on. We have a legal means to pursue payment and different things. We have, much more, uh, we have many more options for survival than a servant did or a maid. These servants were completely dependent on their master. And they had better hope that they had a good master with a full hand. It talks about the eyes of the servant looked at the hand of their master. It's because the hand was what held the provision. The hand was the hand of help. And it was either going to be full of help and need, for them and their need, or it was going to be an empty hand of a master who didn't care and said, go figure it out yourself. This is a picture that describes our dependence on God. It's interesting, the, the, actually, the, um, the psalmist here, you notice he changes. He, for the first verse, he's saying, unto you, I lift up my eyes. Now in verse 2, he's speaking corporately. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hands of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. This is a corporate cry to the Lord. A, a, a call of God's church, not just, not just an individual Christian. We're an individual believer. This is, the, but he's recognizing, him, just as that servant, look, look at what we're going to do. We recognize just as a servant depends on his master, so we depend on our God fully, completely. We need his mercy. We need his grace. We need everything from God. Without him, we are nothing. And so we are going to look up to him, and we are going to seek his face, and we're going to cry out to him until he has mercy on us. We have no other choice, no other place to go. Now, you know, for our physical provisions and our physical needs, uh, we might think there are other options. We don't really need God. We can find all sorts of other means. So we think. We can, we can get another job. We can, we can steal what we need. I'm not saying all these options are good. I'm just saying we, we can steal things. We can do all, try to find all sorts of things. But leave aside that. Think of your soul. What help do you have for your soul outside of God? There's no other way to heaven. There's no other way to peace and a good relationship with God. Many, many will peddle their wares spiritually. They'll promise all sorts of things, but they can't deliver. Only God in heaven can provide. And that is true still of your physical provision, by the way. But, it's, but even as you just think, leaving that aside, think of your spiritual need. No Lord, there is no peace. You need your master in heaven. Who is this one going? Who is he saying we need to look to? We look to the Lord our God. Lord. 
covenant-keeping God, Jehovah God. It's interesting, when he's talking about hands of master, you know, the word Lord, when we read it in our English Bibles, Lord, L-O-R-D, just small, small letters, refers to the master, refers to, uh, that, that refers to God and his kingly rule, or his, 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 ma- his mastery over us. But it's interesting that the psalmist here, although he's speaking of masters, doesn't refer to the Lord in that term. He refers to the Lord as the term for Jehovah, capital letters, L-O-R-D. Jehovah God, that's who he depends on. Because this master is not just any master. He is the covenant-keeping God. He's the one who started a relationship with us and is maintaining that relationship with us. This psalmist and, and the people that are worshiping with him, and you and I as the church can look up to this Lord our God because he is one who has prom- made promises to us. He's established a relationship with us. And he has a character that is true and faithful, and he will never deny his own name. He'll never deny his own promises. He is our God, because that's who he's made himself to be. How long will, is this commitment to look up? It's until God has mercy, until God shows favor to his people, until God has compassion on us. This is really pleading the language of, of the Aaronic benediction in Numbers 6.25. Lord, uh, bless us and keep us, Lord, make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. That's that word for graciousness. It's the same term. Lord is saying, they, they hear the blessing and now they're crying out to the Lord in their trouble and they're saying, Lord, fulfill your blessing, fulfill your promise, be gracious to us. This is not a glance to heaven. It's not a quick glance up, but it's a fixed position of seeking the face of the Lord and putting their hope in him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not our own masters. We are not our own masters. That was the problem in the Garden of Eden. That was, that was what led to the fall. I don't want God over me. I want to rise to the level of God. And that's still the problem of man. We want to be autonomous. We want to be our own masters. I will do what I want to do, what I feel like I am or I'm going to do. It's a humbling place to say, I'm not my own master. But it's the only place, it's the only way you'll find mercy. You don't, when you realize and recognize you're, you're, you cannot satisfy your own need and you need him. The only place for mercy is to humble yourselves before God. He's the one who has, has come and made provision for us. He's established a covenant with us as his people in Jesus Christ. He is our master in that relationship. And you and I can come humble before him and we can cry out to him with all our needs through Jesus Christ you know Jesus Christ the greatest emotion of Christ the one that's that's given to us most in the gospels as you read the gospels is his compassion his mercy he has a compassionate heart for his people it's a compassionate heart for sinners as well and we can come and expect the help of our God so that we can serve him we can live for him we can get, do for him whatever he requires of us. You and I need to have, should have no doubt that our master is good. Our master is lovely. Our master is the one we, are, we need. And what the church in the Old Testament knew, we know much more that we have such access to God. We can come to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, which they knew of the promises, but we have seen that the fulfillment in Jesus Christ is the greatest evidence of God's mercy and compassion that this world has ever seen, that you and I have ever and will ever experience. We can look up to heaven. We must look up to heaven and to find, and we will find there in, in Jesus Christ a compassion in hearts that as we cry out to the Lord until he has mercy on us, we can have confidence that he will in fact have mercy on us. We are not crying in vain. To look up, look up with expectation to God who dwells in heaven because he alone has the help you need for the trouble on earth. Well, we've considered in this first point the look up to heaven. In the last couple of verses, we will consider the distress of the church. No matter the trouble that's here on earth, the message is you can look up to heaven and find help from there. So look up. We've looked, look up to heaven and look up from earth. That's what these, the, these worshipers are doing. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. The, 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 there's a resolve. The resolve was made to look up. And now they're looking up and they're crying for help. They're crying for this favor. They're crying for this compassion that they were needing. 
The Lord at times does test our trust. At times the Lord does, uh, does seem to remove himself from us so that we, it, it reminds us of our need for him, that we're not independent, that we're not self-sufficient. We need him. And God tests our confidence. Where are we going to look for help in our time of need? You and I often are dangerously proud because we don't know our own need. We think we can get by on ourselves, and God humbles us, reminds us of our need from him. And that's what's going on in God's people here. They're crying out. They're saying, Lord, have mercy on us because there's a trouble. There are those who, who, are, who are oppressing them. And there's a, there's a great need. It's emphatically repeated. Have mercy on us, O Lord. The second and final time the covenant name of God is, is used. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us on us we read the Luke 18 parable we get a sense here don't we is, is, is you see the parallel between their cry here and that poor widow who was going to this judge who had no regard for anyone else he was just there to serve himself the unjust judge and this widow keeps coming have mercy have mercy have mercy and the next day and the next day and the next day maybe morning noon and night she's there and she's saying have mercy and finally, this judge just wants to get her off his back, and he says, fine, I'll deal with your problem just so you leave me alone. And Jesus says, if that's the response of an unjust judge, what is the response of God toward his elect going to be? He loves the people he loves, the people he's chosen, the people he's set apart for himself. God is not an unjust judge. He's always a just judge, and he's one full of love and compassion for his people. Well, why did Jesus give that parable? Luke tells us. Jesus gave this parable so that they would, that they would take heart and, and not give up. That they would ought to, oh, man, he, he spoke a parable to them that man always ought to pray and not lose heart. And Jesus goes on to say that, that as God's people cry out to him, God will come and avenge them speedily. Now, God's Timing is always the best time. And the question that comes to the end of us of that parable is, do we actually have the faith to believe it? And are we actually willing to be persistent like that widow who had some earthly trouble? Are we willing to be persistent before the throne of God for the care and the needs of our souls and the need of the church? The context of, of this, uh, this psalm is perhaps the context of coming out of exile. They were... They were, uh, or they perhaps may have been in exile, or uh, they, were, they were crying out to the Lord for mercy. But either way, there were those who were oppressing them. Perhaps they, they were those, whether they were still in the land and there was an enemy that was controlling them, or whatever the situation might be, those in authority, those above them were smug. They were a people that were at ease, those who had no troubles whatsoever in this world, and they were oppressing those underneath them. Their soul is that our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, the mocking, the boasting, the, the laughter, the contempt of the proud. They look down on us. And it looks like they're just cruising through life, enjoying life. Or they're, they were satisfied, no anxiety there. It's like think of North Korea, where you have where you have the leadership so smug and at ease and feasting and doing all that they need, and, and the people starve. The other dictatorships where this happens. Here is the same, the same situation. This contrast between the wicked and the righteous, it's very interesting. When he says, uh, we are exceedingly filled with contempt, or we're exceeding, our soul is exceedingly filled, it's a language of, of being satisfied. It's a language we might say with, uh, when we eat food, we say, I'm stuffed, or I'm filled to the brim, in the context of we've eaten too much. Now, it's interesting, in the wicked's context, they're probably saying, they're saying, we're filled too, but they're filled with all these good things of the world that they've been taking to themselves, whereas God's people are crying out, and they're saying, we're filled up with the oppression. We're, we, are, we are filled to the brim with the contempt and the mockery of the world. We're oppressed. This is not just this strange time in history where they happen to be oppressed. No, this is the post-fall reality of the church. We are oppressed, again, because we're up against the rebels who, will, who are fighting against, continue to fight against the Lord, and who will always uh, slander the church with murderous words, and will always act against the church with murderous acts, and who will label the church with all sorts of things to try to bring the people of God down, labeling them. And you can hear the labels, how, how bigoted we are, and intolerant, and, and puritanical, and, 
and, uh, and all sorts of other, we're, we're, we're haters. And what we say is hate, are hate crimes. And those who oppose the church are often that they're on the popular side of opinion. It's much easier to, to, to beat someone up or to yell at someone uh, when you're on the popular side of opinion. It's very hard to stand up alone. But they mock because their hope is in themselves, though that's never a good place to put their hope. And they don't have a response to the, to the church, to the message of the gospel. They have no answer to the, the guilt that they have in their own heart. And so all they can do is, is, uh, is scream down their own consciences and try to shut you up and shut us up as the church and to stop the gospel message and to, to say, you can't say those things. We also, as the church, are exceedingly filled with contempt, with the scorn of those who are at ease. What is our response as the church? We must seek the Lord's help. We must cry out to the Lord until he has mercy upon us. Jesus says in in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. There's the scorn and the contempt that's poured out on the church. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You can cry out to the Lord for help, cry out to him for compassion. Jesus Christ has compassion for his people in oppression. And he shows that compassion. He he loves his people. He knows what you're going through. The Lord in heaven hears the mockers. He hears those who, would, who are, seem to be at ease and are mocking his church, and he hears the cries of his people who cry out. They look up to heaven from their trouble on earth. He shows compassion, and he gives boldness. It's interesting, in the Beatitudes there, Jesus then goes on right from there to say, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He's not saying, shh, just be quiet and let it pass. He's saying, no, be bold for the gospel. And yes, there will be this trouble, but I will be there. I will give you the help that you need. And in the end, you will receive the reward of eternal life. You see, the psalm ends in, in a strange way. It, it seems to end on this, this low point, this point of mockery. We're full of contempt. But it actually, it's, it's not ending there. It's ending where it began because they're crying out to the Lord. That all this hope is flowing through and the hope of, this, of these worshipers is such that they say, Lord, this is what's going on, but we'll go back to you. We'll wait upon you. We'll trust you. We trust you, our Lord. They're leaving their need at the foot of God, trusting him to hear, to help, to care for them. You can look at Psalm 124. That gives you one picture of a response. We sang that earlier in the service. Uh, just it's very similar language except there there's a, more, a fuller description of the response of God we can also turn to the New Testament to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to find the fullest response of God to our need God's greatest answer of mercy and compassion to the cries of the church Lord show compassion upon us and the Lord says I will give you my own son I will give you the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one you need. He is the one we have. He is our king. He's a king full of compassion. He's the one who, who uh, restrains and conquers all his and our enemies. He defends us. He rules and defends us. He knows what's going on. He is our king who is active in our lives and loves his church. We are servants of the greatest king. He is the best master. We can trust him. He'll provide in all our needs. Whatever our situation is as the church, whatever we face, He provides. He provides. And so we can look with expectation to Jesus Christ, the one who dwells in the heavens. We can look up to him from earth. He has the help we need for the trouble on earth. Consider this this morning as we've Consider Psalm 123, looking up to heaven from earth, putting our trust in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God himself, our king on the throne, our our mediatorial king, our God who is merciful, compassionate, who sees our need, hears our cry, and provides always. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we must be like children, persistent children, persistent at the throne of grace. We must be like servants, dependent on God and coming to him with dependence and with expectation. He promises help and he delivers us. You know, even as we sit here this morning and we're able to participate in the Lord's Supper and we'll 
again, uh, the congregation gathering this afternoon, and we're able. We, God has heard and answer our cries to him in regards to COVID, in regards to even the restrictions on worship. God has heard our cries in so many ways, beyond even just larger numbers for gathering. He's heard our cries and our prayers as a church. Let's give thanks to God. And we must remember, we can come to him. He's never impatient with us. He's never impatient with us. We can be impatient with our children. He's not impatient with us. He wants us to come to him. Let us lift our eyes up to heaven all the day. Nothing is too small, nothing too minor, nothing that makes God annoyed. You've never come to God, the God in heaven with your troubles. You've never come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then today is the call to come. Come to the Lord with your greatest need, salvation in Jesus Christ. Today, we've not only, we not only have the privilege as the people of God to hear of the mercy of God and the preaching of the word, but we also, in the Lord's Supper, will have the reality of that mercy pressed upon us, pressed upon our senses. And the signs of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup, the Lord himself comes to seal upon us the greatest mercy that he's ever given, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The sacrament has been given to the church because Jesus Christ has compassion upon his people. Because he knows our need, he knows our weakness, he knows our dependence, and he provides. He provides abundantly. He shows compassion to us. And so, brothers and sisters, as we prepare to come to the Lord's Supper, let us do so with a humble dependence upon him with a declaration of our need both to remember what he has done, Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us and our need for communion with him and his body and in his blood. Let us come with eyes of faith lifted from the symbols on earth to the reality in heaven. Let us come with an expectation this morning even that he will show mercy. He'll have compassion on us and he will bless us. Amen. Lord in heaven, we thank you for your word. We come, Lord, and we pray that you would look upon us with compassion and help us in our time of need. We pray that you would give us a, a faith that results in persistent approaches to the throne of grace, that we would persist in prayer, that we would continue, Lord, praying according uh, as much as we know, according to your will, that we would, we would pray fervently for that which pleases you, that we would seek your face, and when we seek your face, Lord, we do so with humility, knowing that from your hand comes every good thing. Lord, we pray that you would uh, continue to remember us as the church. Lord, we're not in this world as we face, as we, as we live counterculture, we're not to feel sorry for ourselves and to whine and complain or think, poor me, but Lord, we're to, we're to live courageously and boldly through the power you give us, and in our troubles to, to take comfort in you. Thank you, Lord, that you provide in every way. Help us, Lord, to, um, to live a, a life that is dependent upon you and, and that is thankful for your care. Lord, as we come to the Lord's Supper in these next moments, we prepare our hearts here to participate. And for those who will come later and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper again this afternoon, we pray that, that uh, you would prepare our hearts to receive these things in faith to be joyful and thankful for what you give us. And to remember this is, again, a good, compassionate gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. Apply this sermon to our hearts, to each one. You know our need. Hear us, Lord. Shine your face upon us and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's sing standing hymn 420. M 420, at the Lamb's High Feast we sing.
please be seated.